time. But um, let me now usher in that second phase, and I'd like to invite Rosa, who's from uh, Apple, to discuss one of these contexts. Thank So thank you for having me. Um, um, I'm obviously considerably shorter. Um, so my name is Rose Lejeune, and I'm um, a multi-dependent curator uh, based in London, um, currently um, dependent on, on the Underground and the Arts Council UK for a research grant, and also for Diapol, or with Diapol. Um, so I'm going to talk about the first of the kind of um, series of three like historical case studies. Um, and I guess this is not a kind of critical kind of um, evaluation of, of this as a, as a program, but a, more of a kind of description of the elements of it. Um, so I'm going to talk kind of about American Fine Arts, which is a gallery in New York from 1984 to 2004. Um, and I'm going to look at each of the kind of cornerstones of it as a, as a commercial gallery. So looking at very briefly at the director, um, the gallery's location, the program, the idea of kind of um, how it represented and promoted artists, and finally this idea of commerce. Um, so I'm kind of interested in American fine arts um, because of the way exactly that has just been described. Um, there's a real sense of the kind of distinction, I think, between production and mediation and commerce that runs through the programming. Um, so to start with, um, I think it's really important to kind of introduce the director himself. So um, he's on the right here um, with a very young looking Mark Dion. Um, and um, he's really kind of central to the idea of, of the gallery um, as this kind of bohemian, charismatic, charming character um, who kind of really represents in many respects the kind of enduring interest and appeal of um, American fine arts. So um, the German gallerist Christian Nagel said, said about him, there he stood, American trucker hat, cigarette hanging out the corner of his mouth and a cheap jacket, often with a thin tie, diverse trashy jewellery from Canal Street. Um, or in his book um, about Colin Deland, Dennis Bork says, what constitute charisma? Who knows, but Colin had it. He was masculine in his mannerisms, Body and his body language, but ask him to put on a wig or a costume and he wouldn't hesitate. He had an outward self-confidence and an inner need to be around people. A gifted conversationalist, he could go as deep in time as the conversation would allow when engaged with the finer points of an artist's practice. He was the sounding board. Collectors and others in the art world relied heavily upon his opinion. He knew what he was talking about and could spot a fake a mile off. So it becomes quite obvious quite quickly that the kind of persona of the gallerist is really central to the, to, to the space. Um, but also there's this idea of this man as a kind of, exactly as a kind of disinterested person who looks, who's not really kind of interested in looking the part or playing a specific role, but really engaged in types of practices um, and, and in the ideas around them. Um, picture of him there in his, in his um, office. Um, so so I, mean, it, I think this picture is great because it really kind of puts it in a very particular time. And um, just to step back quickly, um, the gallery existed from 1984 to 2004 um, and had various incarnations in bits of New York. So first in the East Village, then in Soho and finally in Chelsea. Um, and I guess 1988 in New York was a time when those first kind of galleries as like big museum showrooms were starting to open. So, for example, first Gogosian opened um, in the mid 80s. There was one in LA before, but the first in New York was in 85. First Pace, um, and then by the kind of early 90s, galleries like Matthew Marx, Green Natale, Gladstone, and Metro Pictures were all kind of starting up. Um, and American Fine Arts is really kind of a part of that, um, but it's also kind of deliberately slightly off centre from it. So. Um, even when they moved to Chelsea in the kind of mid 90s, um, they were kind of a few blocks down from everybody else and in this sort of hard to find building next to a timber shop and without a sign. Um, I've got a couple of pictures of the gallery itself. So, <coughs> whenever you see pictures of it, it really kind of look, starts to look like a sort of, like it's not, it's like very much unlike what your idea of a kind of commercial gallery was. Um, and in that way, I think that the programme kind of really sets itself up as a, in, in relation to other galleries and as something much kind of tougher. Um, so, for example, Deland showed Richard Prince's appropriated nudes of um, the prepubescent uh, Brooke Shields, so there's ones where she's kind of naked and covered in oil, um, but also he collaborated a lot with um, Prince. So, uh, 
through the kind of pseudonym of Jay Dog or Jay S. Bernard. They did a whole series of projects together. Um, and Deland was really kind of, in that sense, um, very integral to developing his programme in a very particular way. Um, so, for example, um, he set up a, a group called Arts Club 2000. Um, uh, with a group of seven Cooper Union students um, in, who studied under Hans Hack in about 1992 um, as a kind of institutional critique <coughs> for his own institution. Um, so there was a series of projects, one looking at the gap, and um, in 1996 they conducted a series of interviews in a project called Soho So Long. Um, so at the time there were only kind of a few galleries in Chelsea, but, um, and that kind of economic prosperity hadn't really kind of kicked in yet. Uh, but the subsequent, and so you can't really foresee what's going to happen in terms of that kind of sort of mass migration that's going to turn Chelsea into what it is today. Um, but that material is really relevant in terms of thinking about how galleries transform neighbourhoods and kind of looking at those kind of perspectives um, in terms of like plotting it at a very particular moment. Um, but I think in terms of American Fine Arts and, and Colin Deland's position, um, he really sees that exhibition and working with that group of students as a way of kind of addressing the strategic location of the gallery and really thinking about through his program explicitly its networks, its kind of symbolic values, its real values as well, um, and also its kind of own involvement in the gentrification process. Um, so another example, so that's the outside of um, Soho So Long. Um, some kind of so it turned into a kind of 300 page photocopied book of all sorts of interviews and photographs of, of Chelsea at the time. Um, so another project that he worked on, for example, which I couldn't find any photos of, um, was a series of he did a series of exhibitions with with Christian Philip Muller, um, and one in 1992 called A Sense of Friendliness, Mellowness and Permanence. Um, was based on his kind of idea about trying to find a second funding stream for the gallery. Uh, so um, he and Muller together turned uh, part, of the part of the gallery into a kind of cafe bar, so completely kind of functional in the, in the sense of like you could buy a coffee there and you could sit down. Um, and they set it up like with one of these almost like a kind of American um, standing uh, maitre d' desk in at the front of the thing with the history of the gallery written up on it. So that was the kind of menu that you could choose from, was a list of the exhibitions and all of the prices. Um, so Muller's practice until that point had been really about kind of conceptual books. So alongside that, he was presenting his books as part of this cafe. Um, but I think, again, it's about putting those books in the context of the gallery and kind of Deland thinking about how to offer it like a practical solution um, about what he could sell, given the fact that the exhibition that he was putting on um, wasn't really going to sell anything. So it was like, OK, this is a commercial space, so we sell coffee instead of books. Um, but again, there's that real sense in which Deland's interventions in practice are kind of him thinking through that practical kind of um, idea about how to run a commercial gallery without worrying about selling um, work. So there's always a kind of practical framework around which he's putting um, the artist's work. Um, so in that sense, I think as well, what's interesting for me is that American Fine Arts is a place where exhibitions are kind of performative and transformative and everything becomes like an action. Um, so that it sits within this context of a commercial gallery, um, but actually that commodification of those objects is really sort of refused or defused through um, the actual situation and the exhibition that it's sitting in. Um, so I think that's quite kind of crucial for me looking back at it now. Um, but also that the, com that the program has this real strong idea about the conversational um, and the kind of generative in terms of, of relations between the artist and the audience. Um, so it's not about conviviality, but it's about conversation and attention and conflict through that conversation. Um, so in tandem with that, though, I think that there's a real kind of sense in which he's looking at a gallery as a place where anybody can come and everybody gets treated the same and it's a kind of hangout space and it's, it's his studio in that sense, um, but it also can become an exhibition space. Um, uh, but the exhibition is like very much like a part of that process. Um, so again, to, to, to quote Dennis Bork, he says, the shows were aggressive and strange and funny and poor, plus all my friends were there. It felt, it felt possible to invent your old, own world in that context with people you really wanted to be around. And it wasn't just art people. It was in the midst of an economic recession. It felt very strong, like American fine arts was really in its element in crisis. 
Colin had no money, so it felt okay that none of us did either. Um, and I think similarly, you know, American Fine Arts' position about artistic liaison was very much not really one of advocacy, that is, he wasn't really interested in promoting artists' work or helping their careers. He saw his role as being to show art um, and then leave it up to the viewer to determine the effects and the value of that work. Um, so they didn't really have an advertising strategy, they didn't do a mailing list, they didn't do press releases. Um, his rationale being that there's this really small window of time within which um, the work of art can be experienced kind of outside of language and before it gets shaped by language and he wanted to keep that open as long as possible so it wasn't his job to m prematurely close down that meaning and instead to just leave it completely open. Um, so I think for me, you know, in terms of thinking about um, the gallery as what it might represent today, um, there's really this uh, sort of enduring idea about um, integrity that in terms of how you might show a work, in terms of how you might talk about a work, but in terms of how you think about when and whether and to frame it as a thing to sell. Um, so in fact, Colin Deland apparently worked most of his life as an electrician to carry on kind of putting on the programme. Um, and so the, you know, in that sense, he's really kind of balancing the pressures of commerce um, to, to, to in the favour of worrying about the programme. So American Fine Arts kind of really stood on this economically shaky ground, but at the same time managed to be kind of influential and somehow glamorous. Um, and it's a methodology that I think offers kind of a position of kind of critique, but also this simultaneous being on the inside of something and being on the outside of it. Um, so, so from this, I'm not really going to kind of attempt any like conclusion or kind of um, idea about 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 critically kind of like deconstructing what he was doing. I mean, he had a really interesting relationship to art fairs, for example, um, and obviously there's the whole mythology of him as a figure. Um, but I think in terms of what was just being spoken about, it's quite nice about this idea of it not being a kind of it being a kind of non-opposition between the commercial and the non-commercial, and that that sense of um, how you balance those pressures is really strong with it. Um, but also. Um, uh, so, so to finish, um, I think that, that, that there's a piece just recently written about American fine arts by Victoria Camblin in Art Papers, um, and she kind of sums up his approach and how it might have a relevancy for younger generations. And she says, potential, even imminent, fuck you to the art establishment, to whomever, seemed to hover in the air around American fine arts. It was exquisitely branded, or rather anti-branded, and Delan's approach freed up space for unmitigated engagement with the work. It was also just classy. Thank you.